Hello, everybody. I have Dr. Fenwick here, who's a prominent neuropsychiatrist who has studied epilepsy, but his fame is in studying near-death experiences. He has published numerous books and is world-renowned for his studies in near-death experiences. I want to welcome you, Dr. Fenwick, and want to thank you in advance for agreeing to do this interview. Oh, it's a great pleasure, and I'm very pleased to talk to you. Well, before we start, can you give just a quick background on uh, what you've been doing in your career and what got you interested in near-death experiences? Okay, I'm a neuropsychiatrist, and um, that means I'm interested in both brains and minds. And I was very fortunate in my uh, post just postgraduate training, I came across Sir Dennis Hill. And Sir Dennis Hill was one of the first people in the UK to recommend to the government that EEG machines were put in every mental hospital. Because at that time, people were very excited about this new field of uh, electroencephalography. And it, they felt then that it would give you a very good account of of uh, people's behavior and a good, a good way of diagnosing various illnesses. It never actually turned out like that then, but it's getting much closer to it now. So I, uh, with, with his encouragement, I started uh, looking at different mental states. I was also around at the time of the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, which you will remember, and the Beatles. <laughs> yes. I was lucky to get George Harrison to come and sit under my electrodes. Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, when, I was, when my technician was sticking them on his head, he said, I'm never going to do this again. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he never did. And the interesting thing about George was that um, uh, we s told him, OK, uh, please do meditate. And we were recording uh, his EEG. Now, imagine somebody with the Beatles' um, hectic schedule and imagine that they have learned to meditate. And there's no doubt he did because he began to show all the rhythms that I would have expected of meditation. Mm -hmm. He's going to slip into sleep. And that's exactly what happened. And so. That's remarkable. We, uh, we had to make the decision, what do we do? Wake our beetle up or let him sleep? <laughs> I looked at the record and decided probably it was best to let the beetle sleep because we had enough uh, EG uh, to sure. talk about and, and show that he was meditating and what it was. When I woke him up at the end and told him, okay, the session is over, would he... Um, uh, how was he? He said, oh, great. Meditation is terrific. And I said, are you feeling rested? He said, yes, of course. And I said, uh, do you think he went to sleep? He said, absolutely not. All the meditation. And so there were, there were interesting and exciting things then. And that moved on to um, another development amongst many others that I was interested in. And this was the book uh, written uh, in the States for, uh, on near-death experiences. It was the first one, Life After Life by Raymond Moody. And uh, he suggested that near-death experiences were real and they occurred. Now, I knew they didn't. <laughs> it's ridiculous. <laughs> Can, can you sort of define what near-death experiences is for the audience? Yes. What Moody said was that some people in a, who had a cardiac arrest and were resuscitated had an experience which had certain characteristics which I'll go into. And these were fantastic, like uh, going down the tunnel, meeting a being of light, meeting dead relatives, going into a fantastic, wonderful, loving environment. Some of them had a life review too with all the characteristics that it has. 
and then they would come back again. Now, come on, you know, and I know that this is just pure imagination, nothing but that. And so I wasn't really interested in it. I knew about it, but was interested. You were a skeptic. Uh, I, well, obviously Moody had something, but it was way, way, way outside my understanding of what the human brain and the mind does. Mm -hmm. The fact that it occurred during uh, or after cardiac arrest um, suggested that it may just be uh, a quirk of the brain, if you like. Mm -hmm. So I was very surprised when one day this guy came into my consulting room. He uh, was an escapee, if you like, from another hospital. He'd been very badly frightened when a cardiac procedure went wrong and his heart stopped and he told me just like Moody said that he went up to the ceiling and saw his body down there saw the resuscitation process and the panic that was going on then he went down the tunnel and had a full blown and near death experience so um, there was the evidence in front of me so I thought that this um, was... If I may ask a question, as someone who's purposely trying to be critical, uh, as something others might ask is, how do we know the person was not somewhat conscious and awake and was able to interpret the visual things that he was seeing or hearing, and then that turned into a memory which he thought was seeing when he was dead? Yeah, it's a very good question, that. Uh, one of the points about the cardiac arrest ones are that after 11 seconds or so, maybe a bit longer now, um, the, uh, all, all cortical activity ceases, uh, all the cortical drivers stop, and all the reflexes that you have, like the pupils, reacting and so on, the basic reflexes are gone. And uh, if you see somebody in that state, you say they're dead, simple as that. Mm -hmm. and this was the state he was in. So imagination is not a good explanation. We needed better ones. And so mm -hmm. I was able to, to study him. And then I began to get a feel for what a near-death experience in cardiac arrest was. And I was very fortunate because I was asked by a producer in the UK in 1987, I think, on a program to do a uh, near-death experience program. And so um, I was the lead for the program. And so uh, I was able to let everybody know what our then thinking was about the near-death experience. And people were asked if, if they wanted to and had experiences like this to write in. And then we got a fascinating uh, period when we got 2,000 letters, lovely letters, those things that you open and take <laughs> Not click on, but actually open. Email, no. <laughs> and uh, the, there were several things interesting about those 2,000 letters. They were very, very varied, and they suggested that the genesis of the EEG was very, uh, sorry, of the near-death experience was very much wider than we thought. So what I did was to take 500 of the ones that I thought were the best ones, if you like. Um, you mean the ones where the variables were very strictly controlled, so you knew when they were dying, there was a specific way, such as yeah. cardiac arrest? No, we hadn't got that far then. The ones I chose were those people who gave good descriptions. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't put a limitation on only those in the certain circumstances that we look at, it was just that they were able to give um, a good account of, of their experience. 
And so I sent all of them a standardized form. So this was a way of getting the data properly standardized. Did you see this? Did you see that? And so on. And we got back finally 450 of those. And I wrote, I wrote with my wife a book on, I think it was about 350 or 300. No, 350, I think. And I learned a lot of things. Firstly, it's a sample which we won't get again easily because none of them, none of them knew about near-death experiences when they had theirs. So that told me straight away that it can't be imagination. They weren't copying anybody. They didn't know what it was. It struck them out of the blue and therefore it was the experience they had. And so that was important. The next thing, 30%, uh, only 30% were taking any sort of drugs. So you couldn't use drugs as an explanation for them all, maybe for some, but not for all. And then uh, when I came to look at the causes of them, they were totally fascinating. It wasn't like the book said at all, it was quite different. Um, there were cardiac arrests. 10% only. There were uh, child, childbirth, there were serious illnesses, meningitis and so on. Uh, and then there were the ones where the person was very frightened that his brain was not damaged. So if you listen to that, then you get, you're you pulled away straight away from um, the brain secreting something because how is it going to secrete the same chemical in so many different situations? And at the other end, after you'd looked at that, there was a group of... And, and, and in, that, in that respect, I think there's some studies looking at uh, Air Force pilots where they're put into these very extreme conditions that secrete these kinds of neurotransmitters, but they never have these out-of-body or near-death experiences. Am I correct? Yeah, that's correct. Um, uh, these are people who are put in a, cent a centrifuge. So what you're doing is you're disturbing uh, cortical activity in, in an interesting way, and they get slow waves and everything like that. So they're not a pure way of, of trying to find out. But as I was saying, at the other end, uh, after you've got the fear-death experiences, you come to the mystical experiences and those which do not seem to have a trigger. In fact, sitting in front of the fire, perfectly possible to have a near-death experience. So you have to change your thinking in a radical way. You can't just think cardiac arrest. Now, to begin with, uh, we just saw cardiac arrest. Why? Because if the uh, brain is down, then uh, you shouldn't be able to argue for uh, brain function. We know a lot more about death and, um, uh, and what happens to cerebral activity. And it's a little bit more complex than we thought of then. But in essence, it doesn't change anything very much. And so it looks as if this was a different mental state which could be precipitated in many different ways. And uh, in one set of those, it didn't need the, uh, the brain to be functioning. Now that's a very strong statement because so, it, that the person is outside themselves, that's what they describe, and yet they have access to the memories of what happened in a non-functioning brain. Do you have any specific examples of things that we could test that they were able to see that they could have just come up with, but physical things around the hospital or something like that, that, that was testable? In other words, you could actually go track and, and see if the person's memory was actually real. Um, there are, in fact, many accounts. Uh, myself and a colleague of mine called Sam Parnia uh, also Sorry about the cat. Um, uh, also um, uh, looked at this, and we thought that uh, if you put uh, pictures or some 
form of information on the ceiling, then this would uh, help if the people went up to the ceiling, uh, they would see it. And if they could report it accurately, then it would be a very good way of showing that consciousness was not limited to the brain. In actual fact, in the ones that Sam and I did then, uh, they didn't work because uh, we didn't get people who went up to the ceiling could have done it. Uh, a colleague of mine, uh, Dr. Penny Sartori, she's an intensive care unit nurse and she read, uh, did her own study. And she put uh, symbols on top of the monitors where you couldn't see them normally, but you would see them if they went up. But nobody looked at them. I mean, the person went up and then out of the window, a person went up and back through the wall. I mean, all sorts of things that they did, but none of them looked at them. Now, there are some very good books on this. And uh, there's one book which looks at the relationship between uh, what actually happened and what the people said happened uh, during a cardiac arrest. And they were extremely good. So there was a, a relationship there. And uh, Penny uh, asked the question, uh, if people say they've seen it, uh, do they do better than those who guess what happened? Because we all know what happens. We've seen it on the telly. But in fact, we don't, because most of them are different. And uh, her argument was, yes, people are better. So that, that was looking quite good. Then there is, uh, there is Ring and his study on blind sight. These are people who are blind from birth, who during the arrest can actually see, or say they can. And as far as one can get it, because they're all historical cases, it looks as if they could actually see what was going on, having been blind and never seen it before. That's very, I think that's pretty conclusive that they're, they're not just imagining, they're seeing it and they've never seen anything before in their lives, so. I, I think it's a very good one. And there are a, a number of cases which are um, uh, suggestive of uh, uh, the fact that you can get veridical information as it's called true information. And they're, they're very famous ones. There is a lovely story of uh, a doctor who was uh, canoeing and uh, her canoe turned over and she was drowned for 20 minutes in the river. Now, in other words, she wasn't breathing. She's on the water for 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. So uh, many of us were a bit skeptical about this because we were wondering if in fact she uh, got uh, her, she had an ND while she was in that state and was she really in that state and so on, all sorts of things like that. But in fact, the evidence was very good. But the most telling factor was that the river was not freezing cold. So there was no reason for her to have dropped her body temperature sufficiently to stop her brain working. So um, you can't argue that uh, she was protected by the cold and then had the near-death experience. You have to argue that it was a true near-death experience, sure. which doesn't seem to be a, a clear cause for. Now, there are a lot of these. There's one called the Pamela Revels case. People want to Google that. So um, just a quick question. What's the difference in definition between a near-death experience and an out-of-body experience? Oh, uh, out-of-body experiences are really quite common. You leave your body, you see uh, what's going on in the room, you can travel out of your body. Sue Blackmore has written some very good books on out-of-body experiences. Um, but in the near-death experience, it's different because you usually go up into a corner of the room. And uh, the ones that of interest to the ones when people are unconscious. And uh, Sam has uh, recently published in his book, The Lazarus Effect, I think, um, a case which he observed or was told about when somebody had uh, needed to have a stent done because they got cardiac pain, taken to the cath lab, um, the 
a uh, person uh, went unconscious and their heart stopped. Now they were using an ordinary defibrillator, you know, the sort of defibrillator you'd get in, um, in a public place. So you get your paddle tile. I don't know why they were using that one, but they were. And he, um, and they, uh, this defibrillator tells you to put electrodes on. It measures whether there's any cardiac activity. And if there isn't, it says prepares to shock, tells you how to set the shock, tells you to stand back and shocks him. Um, and then uh, it waits to see if you've got uh, cardiac activity. If it isn't, it says resuscitate, and then you resuscitate for two minutes. And then uh, the uh, arrest, the, the defibrillator says, uh, now, um, no, no cardiac activity, please um, uh, shock. And they do. And um, in this case, his heart started. Now, there is, in fact, a two plus minute gap when he's deeply unconscious. And when we say unconscious, we don't mean there's a little bit of his brain which is working. No, it's not. He's got six dilated pupils. He's totally unresponsive completely sign those, he's dead. And if he'd been left, he would, it would have become irreversible. And he reports that during that time, he left his body, went up to the ceiling, where he met a woman. And in fact, later on, he describes the woman as being an angel. And he was there watching them. He heard everything which the defibrillator said. Remember, he hasn't got a functioning cortex. He's got none of his brain reflexes. Or even brainstem for that matter, I guess, in some ways. Dead. And um, uh, then he came back into his body, finally, with the, when the shock started his heart and his pressure went up and his brain got perfused again. So that's quite a good one. So um, out-of-body experiences are clearly very different from near-death experiences. Out-of-body so can you tell me a little bit about the work you've done on the new death experiences and the data you've co collected over these years and what sort of a pattern that emerges from these people's experiences, either during the experience and post experience and what are some of the stories that you've been able to piece together? Yes, it's, it's, it was very interesting. Um, their stories are, Protean. By that I mean there are many different stories of different kinds. Uh, it's as if um, there is a sort of common topical description of what a near-death experience is and what people actually de describe is different and that's correct. Um, when I was telling you about the different sorts of experiences, different causes of experience, Although they may have many factors which are similar, uh, they're not uh, all the same by any means. Uh, some people don't go down the tunnel. Some people go down the tunnel and don't go to the end. People who meet the being of light and being of light, uh, which they do after they've gone down the tunnel, speaks to them. He doesn't speak in words. It's all telepathic transfer usually has somebody with him the person might know, like a grandfather or something like that. And then they go into, in, in uh, this country, in America, into this amazing English country garden. But it's not like that, really. Some do. And they see the most beautiful colors, the most wonderful birds, and smell the most beautiful scents, and uh, are the most wonderful, wonderful music that they hear played but not everybody will and then you will have a life review maybe a life review is very specific you see an event in your life and if you look at it at the memory of it in the, in the uh, memory review uh, you will see yourself acting you will see exactly why you acted that way if you cause somebody else pain, then you will feel the pain. 
So if you hit somebody, then you feel the pain, their pain that they had on that occasion. So they are really quite complex experiences, not just running through the memory. It's got another component to it as well. So, so you might... It's almost like reliving the past, not just seeing the past. Uh, it's, it's, it's much, it's very different to that because it's got this other side to it. And of course, if you see yourself doing things which hurt other people, you don't like it, you feel very guilty. And so the question then is, uh, who judges you? And the answer to that is, I've never found a, a memory review where the person hasn't said, I judged myself. So in fact, it's self-judgment. And so you'll tend to remember this when you, the experience is over uh, about this question of self-judgment of your previous actions. And then uh, you are either sent back or you decide to come back. Now, why do you decide to come back? Some people decide to come back because they uh, have something they want to finish or something they want to do. Um, there was uh, one lad who, in fact, was uh, drowned by somebody. Who, he was a gay boy, and the person that he was with tried to drown him in a bar. And he had a near-death experience, and he came back because his role was to tell everybody that being gay is okay. Um, another person uh, was a, a woman who had just had a baby, she knew she had a son, even though she was uh, unconscious at the time. She came back, I, she said to the nurse, I want to see my son. Um, and uh, she came back because um, there was a large pile of her husband's ironing that she wanted to complete. Um, was that worth coming back for? Well, she thought so. so there, there are lots of interesting reasons that people give but there's some very fundamental reasons for them, like uh, the person who came back because they wanted to make sure that people understood that death was not the end. And if you listen to what people say, they'll usually tell you what the reason was that they came back for, if they come back. Otherwise, they don't want to come back, but they do come back, and those people are sent back. So... Um, and. Um, is it true that most of the people that do come back uh, kind of wish they had not because of the extreme powerful feeling that they had when you, wherever they were? Uh, it's really interesting that. It's a fascinating question. Some people, um, uh, when they come back, uh, wish that they could get back again. And I had one case of a, a, a young girl, which wasn't all that young, she was about 25, and uh, she did everything she could to get back. And so she was intensely suicidal. And so we had her in hospital for a year, initially with nurses, with her, 24 hours a day. Because she didn't have any prior uh, psychiatric problems before? Yeah, psychiatric facility. Um, and... Uh, she, she would, any piece, a dressing gown cord or anything, she'd get hold of to string herself up so she could go back. Wow. It took us about a year to get her really integrated back in, into life. Another person was, I was rung up by a GP, general practitioner, and he said that one of his um, uh, patients, who was a farmer, I don't know if you can see the cat, Cat. Nice cat. Obviously, you want to come and join us, do you? <laughs> the cat's name is Casper, and Casper loves Casper. Hello, <laughs> Casper. So you can just just see his ears. <laughs> um, so uh, um, uh, he told me about this patient of his who was sitting in the chair all day saying, I want to go back, I do not want to live, I want to go back, I want to go back. Now, when you think about these cases, you have to be very clear, because uh, it may be that there is a psychiatric cause, like he got himself very depressed, 
or it could be that he's brain damaged if if it's one in which was there was cardiac arrest and he was um, uh, he was in fact unconscious then he might have a degree of um, brain damage now there's a very very good study going on at New York I think it's New York State Hospital by Sam Carlier, who's an intensive care physician, uh, trying to answer these questions in terms of relationship to brain damage and so on. Definitely exciting to follow up on these and, and see the consistencies. Yeah. Now, absolutely. do you know the work done at University of Virginia where they put together over 4,000 cases in the last 30 years of people's near death experiences? And they seem to have a lot of consistency with across the country and continent and yes um there is a very very good series like this which comes from the coma group which is a belgian group in liege and um they have done a textual analysis of thousands of these things and uh, they've done they've done a lot more than that. They've looked at them in terms of seriality, which comes before which, and so on. Done all the statistics on it properly. And in fact, the sort of account which I gave you wouldn't be too far out from what they've actually found by looking at a lot of these things. But do remember that uh, what we're saying uh, is not what you will find. You might have somebody who has a near-death experience. One of the people who went furthest, I think, was a man who uh, was an air traffic controller. And he um, went into a room where there are a whole lot of Zen masters with their faces to the wall, so he only saw their backs. And some, some people do get this. They are, are tested on their knowledge of the universe. And he was. And yet he found himself being able to answer the question. So he had a very high level of understanding of, of what the universe and life was about. And so he then found himself leaving this realm and changing just into pure energy and floating through the cosmos, as he said, uh, as pure energy. And then he came to a point where he knew that if he went any further, he would lose his individual form and fuse with, with the universal consciousness, as he described it. Mm. And um, it was at that point that he felt that he had to come back uh, and talk to his wife and tell her about the sort of experiences she might find uh, uh, when she died. And so um, he, in fact, didn't go through fusion and came back. And I got a number of people who um, uh, get as far as um, being aware that they could fuse with universal consciousness, but just don't and come back. So if I was to tell you that story on its own, you'd think uh, near-death experiences were very weird. But yet, when you look at them all in the round, the simple one is um, probably somewhere near what the textual analysis says actually happened. But if you looked at a totally different population like hunter-gatherers, then it's quite different. And... Uh, there's, there's some experiences which have been written up. A man uh, in a hunter-gatherer population, uh, he had a near-death experience, and he got into his canoe and paddled for three days, I suppose it's equivalent to going down the tunnel. And uh, the place he got to was an island, and the phenomenology of the island is really quite similar to the phenomenology of going into the English country garden. But his way of getting there was quite different, as is the Japanese. The Japanese come to a river and they want to catch a boatman's eye to take them across. So, so your culture or background affects the way you decide. Yes, absolutely right. Um, there's, there's some nice ones from India uh, where um, Osis and Harold 
they called it, I think, bureaucratic bungling, because the in the near death experience, the um, not the uh, not the angel of death, but his his um, uh, his servant comes to uh, pick you up and and take you because you died, and then when your name is checked out on a central register, they find that you're the wrong person, so you're sent back again, and that's why you need... So there, there are lots of stories like these. So think of them as all the same, but all, all definitely not the same. And, that's not the same. and so I feel like the more people talk about it, there's more people who are more comfortable in coming out and discussing their own experiences. Yes. Uh, that's certainly true, and again, there is this very wide range of, of phenomena which do occur. But one of the things which interested me was, in fact, was this a model for dying or not? Uh, if it was a model for dying, then it's enormously important. And so uh, I managed to uh, put together a proposal uh, and had it funded uh, to look at um, uh, what occurs when people die. And I went to the ethics committee and said, um, I'd like to do this. And they, they were very good. They listened exactly to what I said. This goes way back to uh, 2002, Juicy, so it's a long time ago. And uh, the, our understanding of death was not what it is now. And uh, so the, uh, um, the ethics committee said, no, uh, we, won't, we think that it's not right at this point in time for you to talk to the dying. What we would like you to do is a carer study. Ask the carers. And that was absolutely brilliant of them. Because one of the first things uh, we found was that there is a huge division in the hospital, hospices between the nurses and the doctors. The nurses see everything, understand what's going on, whereas the doctors don't, and think a lot of it doesn't happen. At any rate, we managed to, to do our study and were then able to define uh, what an end-of-life experience was. And... Uh, then, um, just recently, again, with Stephen Laurie's unit in, in Liège, they have their textual analysis of the death experiences. They've got this um, overview of near-death experiences. And um, the, uh, we have got our end-of-life experiences and what happened. And you can see that the two overlap. Uh, in most characteristics, there are one or two which are dissimilar, but on the whole, they're very, very similar. And so if you want a model, as far as we can get it, um, then near-death experiences and the actual death process are, are pretty similar. So um, you're saying dying isn't necessarily supposed to be scary. It's a process and not an end in some ways. Say that again. So you're saying that dying is not supposed to be scary and it's not an end, it's more of a process towards something uh, uh, else. Uh, you're, you're asking, uh, one is an extraordinarily good question and one is a question without an answer. The first question is what is the actual events, final event, well, um, there is a lady in Switzerland called Monica Renz. She is a palliative care theologian, and she has done a most amazing study. And I would recommend all your listeners to get hold of her papers and look at them, because she has carried out recently, she deals in, in, with two or three hospices in Zurich, I think, and they... Um, 
and she's looked at cancer patients, 250 in one series, 80 in another. And so she has a very good understanding of the death process, but her study is astonishing. But just think about this. She has four criteria like fear, um, anxiety, uh, spiritual experiences, and so on. There are four categories. And three times a day, three times a day, not just once, but three times a day, she goes and asks the dying to rate themselves on this, or she helps them, of course. And um, what she's done is she's built up a picture of what happens as you move towards death. And what she has shown, and just to, to shorten it, uh, she's shown that one stage is clearing, and clearing is giving up your uh, attachments to things. You have to give up your attachments, because you're not coming back. Um, uh, you're going to die, and there's no point in going to die being sad about missing your children. You give that up, and you turn it around, of course, and say, I'm very likely to have had my children, rather than, um, gosh, I'm going to miss them. And uh, you have to do this with everything. And then she talks about three stages, pre-transition, transition, and post-transition. She's written a book on this. So it's The Transitions by Monica Rents. It's certainly worth reading. And pre-transition is when you go through the giving up process. If you don't give up, then you become enormously anxious. This is called terminal anxiety. And uh, it should be treated by talking to people and getting them to give up and so they can pass easily through death. But sometimes uh, hospitals are short of people, they don't really understand it and so on. And so what they do is they give you an injection of a tranquilizer. To numb you down or something. And that really isn't what it's about. Um, the second one is transition. And this is when your whole egoic structure, that bit of you, the narrative self, the bit of you that thinks it can do and move, etc., dissolves. And then you go in the last stage in post-transition into um, what's called non-dual consciousness. Non-dual consciousness is a form of consciousness where there's no longer you looking at the outside you and the outside become one. And so this means that you get a, a vast expansion of consciousness, but with it, people are usually enormously happy. So it means that we change the whole death process with our understanding of it, is that uh, no longer is death something you should be afraid of, but you have, providing somebody teaches you what to do, and it's easy enough, uh, to go through it, give up, then slowly lose your differentiation and become, become non-dual and part of, of universal consciousness and very happy. Wow. That is, uh, it gives me the chills to think about, you know, how she was able to dissect each step of the way and make it less scary and more of a unknown because I, I know a very good phrase from you about why we're scared of dying is because mostly we don't know what it is and I think this somewhat takes that mystery away yeah I, I, I think it's crazy there are two things that are terribly important two massive changes of consciousness when, when we, one is when we're born and become conscious for the first time the second one is when we lose our consciousness and die. And these transition points are terribly important. Why not? Actually, I know why we don't. But why don't we talk about death? Why don't we teach death? Why don't we have courses on death which people can go to and understand? And um, this is some work I've just come across um, a little late in the day, but I'm pleased I found it now. And it's called existential fear of death existential fear of death really probably has a genetic basis in that 
uh, as a species, we have done everything we can to keep ourselves alive. Um, but in fact, uh, it's meant that if we talk about death, then it has a very profound effect on us and, children, and changes our behavior. And um, just looking to see if I've got the book here which I can show you, which I haven't. I think it's the worm in the apple. Um, and it's, it's a book which all... Uh, yes, it is. This is it. And, uh, you can probably see that, can you? Okay, the worm in the core. Okay. Yeah. It's the most wonderful one. It's written by uh, Eldon Solomon. And he um, uh, has looked in Sheldon Solomon and two, uh, two other co workers. There are three of them all together. And you can buy from Amazon. And it shows how fearful we are of death and how it changes our behavior. And he's got a lovely, lovely experience there, uh, experiment of judges, and I, I, I won't go into it in detail because you can read about it, but in essence it's this. Uh, the judges were put into two groups, and they were given pers a personality questionnaire for two reasons. One, to make sure that the groups were equal, so they are, and the other one is that one set of judges were asked how long they thought they were going to live. So it's the only difference between the questionnaires, just one of them uh, being asked how long they thought they were going to live. So we've raised the death word, in fact. Then they were asked to judge a prostitute, I think it was, it doesn't matter, it's somebody who committed a minor crime, for which they'd usually be fined about $50. The first group of judges that had not been given the death question were asked what, how they would judge them, and they said uh, $50. They all agreed, it was easy. Uh, the second group, when they were asked, were draconian. They said $450, nine times more than the other ones who had not had the death question. And when this was pointed out to them, they said, our view has nothing to do with your silly form and the silly question you asked. But it you weren't aware. And And um, in, our, in our culture, if there's a lot of death about, we do things which are very clear and we can see it now. First of all, you'll choose a charismatic leader. And in the UK, we're choosing Boris Johnson, who's charismatic, and you in the United States choosing Trump, who's charismatic. Next is we band into groups that are the same. So uh, you'll find that uh, those people you like you go more towards than those people you don't. So you'll find that the groups are, in fact, uh, much more highly differentiated, if you like. Um, and we don't like people who are not like us. Sure. All the fear of death. <laughs> so in other words, we could bring peace with death. In other words, by understanding death and discussing it, there might be more peace and sort of stepping back from the materialistic world, which creates a lot of the tension and a lot of issues. Absolutely. And that's why it, death causes should be standard, so that we get over our existential fear of death, and it doesn't control our behavior subconsciously. This is the point. It can affect people's behavior and how they, what oh. they do with their world. Just like the judges. Why on earth do you become more draconian? Sure. So, Dr. Fenwick, if you could just quickly summarize, I would, I'd love to continue talking to you about this, but I know you're a very busy man and I don't want to take too much of your time, but sort of maybe summarize what this all means in terms of human consciousness and what are the experiments that are potentially being done to further investigate these and what would be your final words to the audience? I think my final words are the following, and that is that uh, death is one of the major changes in your life that you're going to come across. It's got a, a, a process to it. Learn about it. 
so that you can pass through it easily. And the data shows that if you do certain things like meditating, have a near-death experience, don't have one of those, because uh, you may die in it. Um, so uh, uh, praying, um, meditating, uh, and being curious about the death process. Uh, these are all terribly important things. So be curious when you come up to dying. But for heaven's sake, learn about it. Don't wait. And uh, secondly, I'd say it does look as if the near-death experience is a different state of consciousness. And it does look as if the actual death process itself leads to a different state of consciousness. So you can die happily. So remember that. Thank you so much, Dr. Fenwick. And hopefully in the future, we can have more conversations like this because it's really fascinating and there's just not enough hours in the day to have these sort of discussions. And through these, hopefully you could teach the people about learning death and take that mystery and scare away from them. It's very important when you're speaking to death. Actually, we'll produce some pamphlets. One that I don't have one here uh, on this called... Um, uh, uh, the relatives pamphlet. It's how to speak to the relatives of the dying, or yeah, how the relatives of the dying should speak to the dying. And it's it's a very good pamphlet. You can get that from Amazon. It's something we all need to learn because we all have people that are dying, and we ourselves will be there one day. And it's best to be prepared rather than be scared. And here you are. This is our book, which is the art of dying, and that actually is packed with examples of people's experiences, sometimes as they die, but the relative description of what happened. So it's, it's a book which is worth reading, The Art of Dying. Uh, hopefully my uh, viewers would be able to follow up on it. And uh, it, it is truly fascinating. I mean, all the books you've written and, and the way you describe these processes is just mind-blowing and fascinating. Okay, well, thanks so much. It's been very nice to chat to you today. And so Thank you so much, Dr. Fenwick. Okay, bye-bye. And Casper says goodbye, too. <laughs> all right, bye, Casper. <laughs>